been a while since you've been up here. Look what I got for you. Yeah, and they can, yeah, they can scroll on it. Um, how do you want to do this? Well, um, I wanted to start by saying thank you to everyone here for all of your messages of support and all of the ways that you have um, sent love and goodness and support to our family over the past couple years. Um, and also to thank you for your grace in continuing the party of Blue Ribbon without us last time. Um, it felt really good to us to know that you all were there having, um, having a good time. You know, like Ezra said, celebration has been the way that we have gotten through this year, or two years. Um, two and a half. Two and a half. It's the way that we've gotten through this and that we are truly able to say we are in a better place now than we were before, we like to say Audra left us in better shape than she found us, um, and it's really true. And so thank you for being a part of that. Thank you for partying um, in Puerto Rico. Give yourselves a round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. And I have to say, I've never been more grateful for the freedom of lifestyle, freedom of time and location that our businesses provide us than during Audra's life. You know. um, that is what allowed us to be with her. She was in the hospital for 346 days, and we were able to be there with her for all of those days. And um, you know, it's priceless. In the early days, Audra was in an isolette, which is like a little plastic box, and um, she was really tiny, you know, super fragile. She looked like a little alien jelly bean. Like a little frog. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she did all, all splayed out. You know, like we couldn't touch her a lot. Um, but eventually I was able to open the little door for Isolette and I'd stick my finger in there and she would grab it with her hand. And I'd be there like singing to her, nurses are doing their thing, and then Ezra's sitting there like on his laptop. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Making that internet money, baby. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> or he'd like go out to the lobby and do Zoom calls and it was, um, you know, like we were able to be there with her, and it's, it's so vital. Like, the NICU is like a foreign country. You go there, and maybe like a couple people will speak to you in plain English, but really like the main language of the NICU is medicalese, and they are not necessarily like stopping to make sure you understand, and there's all these acronyms and shorthands, and it's all very fast, and it's all very high stakes. And the way that you get to, um, understand what it is that these people are trying to do to your baby is to be there all the time. Like, you just have to be there. Every morning when rounds happen, which is when the doctor and the fellows and the residents walk around, that's when they decide, like, what's actually going to happen. And that's your, really your only chance to talk to the neonatologist, the main doctor who's making these, like, really life or de death decisions for your baby. And so if you're not there, you miss that. And you might end up, like, making a life or death decision for your child over the phone with someone you've never met. Um, and then like, if you don't answer the phone, then the doctor's gonna make whatever decision they deem medically necessary without you. And um, you know, it's, it's really disorienting, it's really wild. Um, and so you know, like we got to do that, we got to be with her. Um, and so, um, you're doing amazing. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. So, my, you know, like we got to be there, and when we looked around, like I would hold Audra all day. There's this thing called kangaroo care, and that's skin to skin. It's the best thing for the baby. You know, like these babies are supposed to still be in the womb, and so what helps them more than anything is to just be like on their mom's chest, tucked in, like a little cocoon. And like we'd do that with Audra, and suddenly her oxygen saturation would go up, her blood pressure would go down, like she was just better across the board. We we're like the poster child for that. And so I'd be there hour after hour, and I look around, and it was shocking how few other parents were there. Like like none, like just tons. Yeah. I mean, hundreds of critically sick babies, and a, like alone, a crying, yeah. and you just want to go get them, but you can't. I tried. You, you know, it's like, they won't let you. Although you can volunteer to become a snuggler. It's a whole separate thing. We which, were there in the pandemic, so it was like very locked down. Yeah. But now you can, you can go snuggle your local NICU baby 
I'm sure they do a background check. Probably, but. yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, but <laughs> it's really sad, you know, yeah. all these critically sick babies and it's nobody there. To, yeah. And the doctors and nurses are busy. So these babies are just crying. And it's like rough. They do what they can, but, you know, there's no substitute for a baby's mom and dad. <laughs> but, yeah, and, and so, you know, I got to know the other moms that were there, and I would get to talk to a few of the other women who would come in from time to time. And, you know, it's like most of these babies are not there because nobody cares about them. They are there because their parents don't have the financial stability to be able to drop everything, or they don't have the type of job where, you know, they can be on Zoom meetings in the waiting room and still conduct business as usual. And so, you know, that I know that had we had a different financial situation, Audra's life would have been really different. She wouldn't have been able to come home, you know. Um, and for the first 10 months that she was in the hospital, even with our ability to be there, we weren't sure that she'd be able to come home. You know, it's really life or death most of the time. And um, as harrowing as that was, I never had to worry that um, when we got home there wouldn't be food on the table. I never had to worry that um, we wouldn't be able to find a place to live close to the hospital and didn't have to worry that like our mortgage would go unpaid or that we didn't, wouldn't be able to pay rent or something like that. Um, and so that was an incredible gift. And then on top of that, we live in a rural area. So when, we, when it came time to bring Audra home, there wasn't nursing coverage. She qualified for 24-7 care. But if you don't have someone to provide that care, what good does that do you? And so we paid out of pocket. We hired our family and our friends, and we built Team Audra as a way of having enough support for her to actually be able to come home. Um, and you know, at the beginning of the day, Ezra said that money cannot buy you happiness. And that is absolutely true. A little too far. Um, thanks, babe. But <laughs> that's about the right spot. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. That's good. That's good. Um, but money can buy you comfort. And in a situation like ours, that comfort was the difference between Audra coming home or not. It was the difference between she's in the hospital alone or she's in the hospital with me there with her. She's in the hospital with me there with her learning to do all of the care that was necessary for her to be released into our, our care to bring her home. You know, we had to do trach changes. So she had a tracheostomy, which is the, the tube in her neck. We had to change that every you know, two weeks. We nearly did not get through. You have to test out. They put you on the spot. I'm not gonna tell this whole yeah. story, but they put you on the spot. You gotta pull this thing out and put a new one in. It's her airway, right? It's like connected to the ventilator. It's what's allowing her to, to stay, keep her lungs inflated. She's got like a minute if this thing comes out and it can get dislodged or it can get uh, you know, jammed up or stuffed up. And you gotta be able to get this thing out, get a new one in, disconnect the ventilator, reconnect the ventilator, tie it all on by yourself which is so crazy difficult. We barely, but we, we, I almost didn't pass this test. They had to put her on this bag afterwards. She was turning all blue. It was wild. She was fine, but. <laughs> barely <laughs> fine. Okay? Ezra is not known for his like. Fine, fine motor, motor skills. skills. Not mine. But I got this tiny little baby and she's like, yeah, it was crazy. It's, it's a thing, you know, they, first they teach you the skill and there's two of you and four nurses and a doctor. And they're like, okay, you've got this. We're just gonna stand here and watch. And they don't tell you until after you do that part. And then they're like, okay, but to bring her home, you have to do it by yourself. <laughs> oh, my God. But, you know, but we were able to be there, and we did that, and we got her home. And once she was home, that is when she really blossomed. Like, she became such a fuller version of herself than we'd ever seen. And she got to experience sunlight. You know, th these NICUs have, like, four windows in the whole place. It's very dark. Um, she got to smell fresh air. She got to meet our cat. You know, she got to wake up and know that we were there. You know, that was the hardest thing was like calling to find out how my baby was, you know. And when she was home, we was just like, oh, I walk into the next room and there she is. And she would wake up and like every morning she smiled. She had cancer, she was dying. And every morning she would wake up and just like grin because we were there. And um, that is a gift beyond anything. 
Um, and, you know, she taught us so much about love. That was her legacy. She taught us that, that the gift of loving her was so beyond the pain of losing her. You know, she taught us um, that we were stronger than we ever could have imagined. She taught us um, that really what matters is, is how you show up and how you are willing to enjoy life exactly as it comes. You know, her life wasn't a tragedy. It was a success, you know. It was a love story. She, yeah. Um, and that was her legacy. And so as we think about how to bring that with us um, going forward, um, we, we want to provide the same opportunity that we had to other families who may not have the financial resources to be able to drop everything and be with their babies. So we created a nonprofit called Love Runneth Over, um, which is really a description of Aja's life. Like, she absorbed more love in her 19 months of life than most people get in a, in a long lifetime. Um, and so we want to, to share that, to, to support other families to be able to be there with their babies in, in the way that we were with her. Um, and so Love Runneth Over, our mission is to provide the financial and logistical support for NICU families to be with their babies in the time that is most critical. You know, be with their babies, make those decisions with them. Be there, you know, because Audrey got to come home. A lot of these babies don't. A lot of NICU babies die in the hospital, and so the only time that their parents will ever have with them is the time that they spend with them in the NICU. Um, and, you know, money can't buy you happiness. Money can buy you the opportunity to take time off work, be with your baby, and, and get to experience their life. And so, so many people have, have asked us, like, what can I do? And um, a lot of these um, NICU families are also on the lower end of the economic spectrum. So they cannot be there. They don't have the money. They can't take off work. They got other kids at home. Um, so we started Love Runneth Over, ladies and gentlemen, to support these families. And um, we're going to be fundraising this year. We're going to match $50,000 in donations. Um, and it's all... 100% of donations go directly to families with babies in need. So no pressure. Obviously, we, you know, we say this all the time, only give from surplus, truly. If you have surplus and you feel like contributing to good causes, we're, we're a legit 501c3, so it's all tax deductible. I do, a, you know, a lot of us business owners do donations at the end of the year as part of our sort of like business tax strategy and all that. This is a really, really good cause. And it's one of those things where it's like you just don't know we would have no idea about the world of, and since this, I now, like, I've talked to many people who have family members who are NICU nurses or who are in that world in some way, and it's like, you know what, real quick, for the doctors and the nurses and the caretakers who care for all people, but especially these critically sick babies, it's such a crazy high-pressure environment, and it, it is a true calling of love. So thank you to all of them. If anybody in your family is in that profession, that is God's work. Um, and so, yeah, so we, you know, we felt like as a way to honor Audra, uh, you know, to take care of other little babies who, who maybe will get some kangaroo care, because there's a real difference when you're alone. There's this little baby, what was her name? Oh, Khadijah. Khadijah, man, I wanted Khadijah. They wouldn't let us take her. It's like, you can't just take someone's baby, but <laughs> little Khadijah is in there, she's right next to us, and all day she's crying. Just, she's the cutest, hairiest little baby, and she just crying all day. And it's like there's, if her mom could take off work and come in and hold her, she would likely have a, a much higher chance, uh, Carrie knows all the stats, yeah. of getting better. So you like, legitimately save lives. Um, so yeah, so you can go to loverunnethover.com. You can talk to Elan. Give it up for Elan, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> who is running our charity. Um, Elan the, was Audra's third parent. Um, she was in the hospital with us learning all this stuff, holding Audra so that I could go eat lunch. Um, and then when we came home, also, you know, 
uh, primary or yeah. among yeah. us three. We three were the primary caregivers for Audra, so she has been in it with us um, all throughout and also knows a whole lot about mamas and babies and birth. And, and hey, you know, regardless of whether or not you donate to Love Runneth Over, the amount of support for us that came through, messages, phone calls, um, you know, emails, just like, it's really, um, it was really beautiful and it really helped, you know? It's like we traditionally have not been that great in the position of receiving. We're great at giving, we like to give. It's good, it's easy. To, in this situation, we were, there was no way around it. We needed help. We needed love, we needed prayers, we needed support, we needed help. And, um, and you guys have provided that as our business colleagues and friends over the last two years of her life in um, some really beautiful ways. So support Love Runneth Over if you can, if that's something you're up for in your business and your life, rock and roll. And if not, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, babe. That was great. Thank you.